Good morning, Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, this is Talking Tax with Tom this morning. Um, and uh, Tom Yamachika is the president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And he joins us as he often does, to talk about what's happening in the legislature. And in this case, also what's happening with the governor uh, in, in this time of COVID. Welcome to the show, Tom. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thanks for having me back. Well, let's, let's address uh, something we talked about before first, and that is the shortfall in the legislature. They're in a three week period now. I guess it'll be the last um, you know, in and out period of their uh, strange 2020 session. Um, and I guess uh, one of the big uh, problems they have is dealing with the shortfall. Last time I looked, it was $2.3 billion. And last time I looked, they just spent 150 million on giving raises to HGEA union members of which there is a certain amount of controversy about that. Um, but, um, you know, how is the shortfall doing and what uh, can they do? What are they doing to, to uh, satisfy it? You know, so far uh, from the bills that I've seen, uh, it's all about spending money, not raising any more. So I guess the good news is uh, that there's, there are no obvious revenue raisers in there that we're, you know, that we're tracking and worried about. Uh, and the bad news is, okay, well, that means how are they going to balance the budget? Uh, you know, it, it may be uh, rating special funds. It may be, um, I don't know, cost cutting. We, we don't know. Uh, it's certainly not cost cutting as far as HGEA or UHPA members are concerned because, um, as, you, as you mentioned, there was a bill to uh, give them previously negotiated raises, uh, and that's on its way to the governor right now as we speak. Chances are he'll sign it then too, eh? I don't see why he wouldn't. Um, uh, but then, you know, other things may happen, like uh, you know, he may take up his furlough pen or, uh, you know, do some budget restrictions, you know, stuff he can do on his own without the legislature's help. Mm, yeah, well, I mean, to the average Joe in the street, Hearing there's a shortfall of 2.3 billion, and then seeing them actually pass a, a, a bill um, to spend 150 million on on a union raise, uh, when so many people are out of work and don't have a farthing, uh, really sounds pretty strange. It sounds like the union put plenty of pressure on plenty of people to get that that through. It's not an appealing move by the legislature. And it would not be an appealing move by the governor if he signs it. True, but there will be consequences if they don't, you know, um, uh, behind the scenes perhaps, but there will be consequences. So that's, that's kind of, I think, the message that uh, they were trying to convey over there. Uh, we don't see most of this happening because it's in the back room, but uh, obviously stuff, stuff like that's going on. That does not endear me, and I don't think it endears anybody to state government, actually. If you want to look for a time when we should be having more confidence in government, um, this is not the kind of thing that generates more, more confidence in government. I agree. Uh, anyway, let's, let's go to the other thing you, uh, you mentioned you want to talk about, and I want to talk about it too, and that is the various proclamations that have come out of the fifth floor from the governor in this time of the COVID, this time of unpredictable, what do you want to call it, uh, sign curves, V curves <laughs> in the chart of new cases and, and deaths for that matter. Um, so sure. plenty of uh, proclamations. Right. Uh, since the initial COVID declaration of emergency, uh, there have been a series of proclamations that have come out of the governor's office uh, spending, uh, suspending a whole raft of laws. Uh, we are now on the ninth supplementary proclamation, which means the 10th one in the series. Uh, a, a, an emergency proclamation is supposed to last no more than 60 days, but uh, they got around that by, by basically uh, amending and restating the whole thing uh, again and again and again and again and again. So, um, uh, so what's happened is uh, there, there's, there's been a whole series of laws that have been uh, basically wiped out by the stroke of the pen uh, the, the list of laws that has been suspended is 20 pages long. Um, and let me, let me show you some of them. Uh, so can I have slide 13, please? Okay. 
So what, what you're seeing now is basically uh, two sentences out of the proclamation. It's an 80 page proclamation. Uh, and what those two sentences say uh, is that, you know, what the, the protections that we're used to having regarding open meetings of public agencies, um, that that's been, that's been basically shredded. And uh, notice of, uh, you know, timely notice of, of public agency meetings, that's been shredded. Uh, the, 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 the second one relates to um, open records. So you as a news organization or myself, uh, we can go in and ask the government for records that are funded by our tax dollars. Now, uh, what, the, what the proclamation basically says is that an agency uh, can basically respond to uh, it, it may has to acknowledge that it, it got the records request, but it doesn't have to respond to it uh, in any particular deadline, which means so so, so it, it, it means your request can languish for months. Uh, I, I, for one, uh, put in a records request to the Department of Taxation. I wanted to see certain, uh, you know, certain correspondence and emails relating to a, a particular provision uh, that we're going to go into a, in a little bit later. Uh, it was it was April when I sent the request. I got a you know, nice polite acknowledgement, but I haven't seen anything uh, in terms of fulfilling the request. It's been a couple months already. Well, so far you've talked about uh, you know public meetings and notice of public meetings and uh, you know responding to requests for information. Uh, working backward, it doesn't seem to me that requests for information um, are connected in any way to COVID or the epi uh, epidemic. But it does seem that public meetings, um, you know, uh, that there is a connection there. I wonder if it's what he did is the right thing, but there is a connection between having a meeting, having a government meeting, having a public government meeting um, and, and COVID. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea uh, behind the emergency power statute uh, was to um, allow the governor to, spend, to suspend things uh, that get in the way of emergency response, okay? Um, but we're talking about day-to-day -day operations of, of, of government, like boards and, uh, boards and commissions, uh, giving the news media what they want uh, in terms of information that the government generates. Uh, how is all of that, um, you know, blocking emergency response? Uh, I'm sure they're gonna say, oh, we, we have to respond. To it that that requires work on our part, and that that's work that otherwise could go to emergency functions. Oh, gee whiz, that's pretty lame, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, yeah. And uh, not only that, uh, but there are other proclamations or other parts of the proclamation uh, that are, are even more questionable as they relate to uh, you know whether they're justified by emergency powers. Let's let's take a look at slide fourteen. Just one thought before we do, and that is, uh, you know, uh, you say that they might have argued that um, it took too much time by government to respond to information requests. How much time did it take by government to write a, uh, an, would you say 80, 90 page uh, proclamation? Um, that uh, including things that don't, that do not really relate to uh, the need to um, suspend laws that stand in the way of emergency response. In other words, I, I suspect this is really overkill to the nth degree here. And somebody spent an awful lot of time in an overkill. Yeah, and then it's copied and copied and copied. So it's, uh, it's extended and extended and extended basically. That's not efficient, but, but then we can go for, further than that. So what, what's your next one, please? Let's go to that. Okay. So um, do you know uh, about tax clearances? Uh, tax clearances are required for a number of things, including uh, when you uh, are trying to sell services or goods to the government. Um, 103.53 is the statute that requires tax clearances and it's been suspended. So what that means now is that the government can do business with whoever it wants, whether they've paid their taxes or not. Ooh. Um, and uh, again, what, what does that have to do with uh, 
impairing emergency functions or blocking emergency services. Well, could it also mean, I don't know if this has been fleshed out, but could it also mean that you don't get tax clearances? There are no tax clearances. Therefore, you can't do business with the government because there must be a provision somewhere else that says the government cannot do business with you without a tax clearance. That's the one. That's the one that's been suspended. Oh, that's the one we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they don't give you the tax clearance, but they still do business with you. Yeah, that's 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 what it says. Okay. So um, an agency can do business with somebody without a tax clearance. Now that that doesn't apply to like uh, you know relicensing. If if your if your regulatory statute re requires you to be relicensed. Um, that's not 103.53, so that may still be in effect. But uh, it seems like the uh, the intent was to say, "Oh, Department of Taxation is doing too much work, so let's 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 uh, not bother them with tax clearances." Hmm. Because, uh, as you say, you could have a situation where somebody doesn't pay tax, and in these days, some people can't pay tax. Uh, then they can still do business with the government. Yeah, you lose control, but um, maybe in the time of COVID, it's justified time. What do you think? Perhaps, but I, I still, you know, have have a great deal of um, uh, puzzlement about how this is related to emergency functions. Yeah, it's way off the the core point of the proclamation. And again, somebody spent 80, 90 pages writing it up. That must have taken a long time. Okay, and let's go to page fifteen. If you, if, if you would, please. Okay, uh, so here's where they hit the tax code. Um, what this one sentence says is uh, that, the, you, know, you know how we have the hotel room tax? Uh, it's already down 99%, but uh, oh, what they're saying is, however it used to be distributed, uh, those rules are now off the table. Distributed so, where? Uh, one significant part of it was supposed to go to the counties. And now the counties are not getting a single red cent from the transit accommodations tax. That's, that's a pretty significant change. That was a change, that was a, a rule, or um, the distribution rule, which was highly, highly publicized, um, much discussed, negotiated, what have you, and now push, it's off the table. That's right, it's off the table. So, um, you know, funding for the convention center or the Hawaii Tourism Authority, that's been suspended as well. The governor can kind of like send the money where he wants to. Uh, the, uh, you know, repayment of the um, uh, Turtle Bay easement that was, that was in there as well, uh, that's off the table. Um, all, you know, that, that distribution provision in the transit accommodations tax started to look like a Christmas tree. Because there's all Sorry. kinds of little presents in there. Yeah, but uh, are they are they but, temporary? Uh, or are they permanent? All of, what, all of them are. Are, are they temporary? They were they, permanent. No, I mean there's the changes that are made by these proclamations. Are these proclamations uh, indefinite, or do they have do they have a, a sunset? Uh, like I said, the 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 proclamations are supposed to last no more than sixty days. Okay. So but, they must be, uh, well, that's not, not very long. Uh, oh, and I see he's been repeating them. Is that it? He's been republishing them after right. they expire? Or before. But, but it basically starts the clock again. So, so, so right now we're in the, uh, in, the, in the tenth iteration of clock restart. Does the proclamation change each time he republishes? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a few things that are added each time. I think um, this current one added the tax, the tax clearance uh, suspension because I, I didn't see that one before. Um, but you know I, uh, I may be wrong, but it's it's one of the more recent ones to appear. How about the how about the others? Uh, they anything with withdrawn, deleted when he republishes? They were they were just repealed, period, or suspended, period. It was only I think. Up to the sixth or seventh one, where they said, "Yeah, well, maybe that was a little overkill. Uh, we we ought to, you know, roll that back a little bit." So, uh, so they went to what's called Exhibit H. Okay. Which which uh, actually came about as a result of 
uh, several nonprofits, including ours, uh, the, the lead of which was uh, uh, Civil Beat Law Center, uh, they negotiated with the Attorney General's office to get some of that back in place uh, or else. <laughs> Good for them. So, uh, you know, is this, these kinds of proclamations, have they happened in the past? We have had emergencies in the past. Oh, yeah. But, but have governors regularly issued proclamations? And, and if so, how does this, this one differ from the, the ones in the past? Um, usually you have a one-time natural disaster like, uh, you know, a hurricane or a tsunami. Um, uh, but this one is, is kind of like a continuing state of emergency, or at least that's what they would have us believe. So uh, it's been... You know, it started in I think March or April, and now it's <laughs> now it's July, uh, and it's still a state of emergency. That could happen. I mean, I'm just thinking, for example, you know, we're learning about this, or he is anyway, um, and we we will have emergencies in the future. In fact, this whole COVID thing may turn out to be a much longer term emergency than already, um, because we haven't solved it, and because we we have the risk, even an increasing risk of COVID infection here. Well, um, yeah, perhaps uh, part of it's because our country hasn't solved it. Yeah. I mean, uh, there, there, there are massive hotspots uh, all over the mainland, some of which are in California. And, and so it's closer than we think, closer than we want anyway. Sure. But you know, I mean, there's other kinds of emergencies that have taken place and will take place. For example, in, in, in the time of uh, climate change, um, even this summer, you know, during the hurricane season, we could have a really bad hurricane um, that would do, um, you know, what Iniki did, for example. Um, and um, in that case, uh, you know, it sounds to me like uh, a declaration of uh, emergency would be appropriate, a proclamation, probably, as in the past. Yeah, no, and that's, and that's what John Y. Hay did uh, yeah. in response to Hurricane Iniki. And it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, th there, there are tax benefits that get triggered upon emergency proclamations. Uh, for example, uh, I, I had a client once uh, who was growing guava trees in Kauai. And, and, and normally they would sell them to uh, a wholesaler like, uh, you know, a, 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 a guava juice maker. Okay. So the, the fruit would be wholesale sales to the, uh, to the guava juice maker. Along comes Aniki, blows the fruit off the trees, um, and uh, obviously there are no sales, but fortunately or unfortunately, the, uh, the client had crop insurance. So the crop insurance comes in and pays for the lost crop. In comes the Department of Taxation, and they say, oh, by the way, uh, your insurance has replaced um, your income. So it's, it's taxable for GE purposes. And they go, okay, that's fine. And by the way, the rate's 4% because you're not wholesaling it. You're just, you're just getting it directly from the insurance company. Well, fortunately, there was an exemption that the auditor wasn't aware of that said, if you have damages from a uh, a gubernatorially declared emergency, uh, then your uh, then your insurance proceeds are exempt. <laughs> <laughs> I hey Tom, you're a good lawyer. <laughs> yeah, but this this shows you in a larger sense. This shows you that um, when you have disruptive events that are emergencies and you have proclamations. Um, there are consequences. There are consequences uh, this side and that side. It's not only the, the raw economic consequences of what happened and how that might affect a given business. It's the tax consequences, too. And um, not to say that this, this particular emergency is going to teach us about all the emergencies to come later, but um, it does teach us, I think, as your experience uh, you know, with, the, with the insurance company, um, is that there are a lot of issues that pop up. There are. It's a, it's a lot of disruption and creates a lot of legal issues. There, there are. So um, 
uh, if if there's uh, maybe what we should do now is take a look at the 636 million that was uh, you know squirreled away into the, um, uh, the the emergency and budget reserve fund, uh, and let's kind of figure out how the how our lawmakers are going to spend it. Mm, please. So the so the current plan, uh, which is in Senate Bill 126, appropriates the whole 636 million, and um, uh, what it what it does is you know right now we have an extra $600 benefit for those who are out of work, that's going to dry up, but 230 million is going to basically be used for a hundred dollar a week benefit. Uh, that's going to replace the 600 okay, for people who are still out of work. There is a, an appropriation of $100 million for rental assistance, uh, up to $500 per month for families who need it. And the target uh, is 34,000 families. There is a, an appropriation for $100 million for a personal protective equipment distribution system. And I'm thinking $100 million. That's, that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, just for a distribution system, what are they going to do? Um, I mean, don't don't you need? To, I mean, all you need is you know a few trucks and, and a few people to to drive around to hospitals and care homes and whoever else you need to to go to, and and just drop off the stuff. I, I don't even know if the hundred billion is is for buying uh, personal protective equipment. I hope it is. Hope it is too. Yeah. Uh, there's supposed to be $90 million going to the airports for screening, testing, monitoring. Um, there is $36 million for workforce development. The, tar the target is to uh, preserve or maintain 2,000 to 4,000 jobs. There are inno innovation grants for cleaning supplies and PPE of $15 million. Um, there is a $15 million uh, subsidy for childcare facilities because they're they're getting hit pretty hard. Um, 900 facilities are supposed to benefit from that. A $5 million appropriation for food distribution matching grants. Can't argue with that. Uh, a $3 million subsidy for the fishing industry. Uh, a $2 million appropriation for 2020 graduate education support. Yeah, I mean, I guess we, I guess we can pay them money because uh, the last half of their school year has been kind of ravaged. Uh, and $40 million for governor's discretionary funds. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Especially, <laughs> especially because, you know, even if the governor were to sign this, um, he could take all the money the next day by writing a proclamation suspending the law. <laughs> we are learning about the ins and outs of proclamations. Um, so that's, it remains to be seen how well this distribution, you know, this, this allocation of the funds is going to work. And we may find that uh, some have too much and some have too little, um, and they have to be changed. So is, does he have the power to change him or has to go back to the legislature? These, these probably will need to be tuned up, don't you think? Yeah, no, I mean, he can just change everything with the stroke of a pen, and that's what, he, that's what he's done in a number of instances. We talked about uh, what he did with the uh, public records and uh, open meeting suspension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he just changes the text in another proclamation then. So, so Tom, here it's we changed. are. Here we are, and it's very clear um, that COVID is, uh, is back. Um, you know, uh, Trump said, you know, we, we had prevailed, it was gone. Um, it was and it'll thinking. magically disappear. Magically disappear. I mean, they, you know, and uh, without commenting on him or his judgment or his leadership or lack, um, in Hawaii, we, we suffer the end of the, you know, the, the raw end of that. Because, uh, you know, if COVID is, is raging on the mainland, we're going to have fewer tourists. And the tourists who come here are more likely to be sick despite all our best efforts to the contrary. And we are very likely to, you know, at least there's a substantial possibility, 
Well, we are having a spike right now, We're having a spike relative to our own numbers. So how does that affect things? You know, at first it seemed, okay, well, we can, we can have a reopening of sorts. Uh, although people in Hawaii are conservative and they're not likely to run back to the same things they were doing. Most of them, I think a lot of them. Um, but now we're having a spike. How is that going to affect fiscal policy? And by the way, the legislature won't be in session when this emerges. Uh, I guess you're saying that the governor will have the power to do stuff in the event of a serious um, resurgence. Um, because the whole thing about a lockdown, you know, comes back uh, into, uh, into the fore. You yeah, may have to lock down again. And, yeah, he and, might have to lock down again. He might have to, uh, you know, dial back on on, on the reopening, he, 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 could, he could do a number of things, all of which are very scary because uh, a number of them are threat to civil liberties um, and, and economic freedom. Yeah, and if he keeps republishing that same long proclamation, there's more incursions on civil liberty and economic freedom all the time because he's, he's, not, he's not really going back and uh, deleting things off the list. He, he's just building the list. He's remaking the Hawaii Revised Statutes uh, in, may, in, many, in so many ways. So what happens to the fiscal policy though? Because our economy is, is gonna be further in the tank. It's already in the tank in many ways. Tourism hasn't really come back. The restaurants haven't really come back. A lot of these small businesses, are, not only have they not come back, but the terminations of employees they made have become permanent. <clears throat> and they're not going to get another tranche of money so soon from Congress. Um, and some of these businesses are gone, gone, gone. Um, what happens if there is and when there is a second reopening? We're going to have a, another problem. We're going to have a, another economic problem that's going to be bigger than, than what we've had so far. Am I right? Well, we have a, we have a big problem now and it's, it doesn't seem to be going away. Yeah. So what, you know, what happens in, the, in between sessions? Does he have enough power to deal with this? Sure, he can do a lockdown. But what about statutes and initiatives and things that will incentivize the rebuilding of an economy? Uh, that's going to be an issue. It definitely will be an issue. And uh, hopefully uh, he can do some good out, uh, out of this, but uh, it's going to take you know, lots of effort and um, uh, and we, we're, we're just kind of hoping that it's not going to be, uh, you know, too much of an incursion in everybody's freedom because that's, that's kind of what it yeah. has looked like until now. Well, the other thing is that, um, you know, not everybody uh, files uh, their tax returns on tax day. A lot of people seek extensions. Uh, and this year, I think a lot of people just turned, turned away from it. <clears throat> they, haven't, they haven't paid their taxes. And we don't know the full thrust of that just yet, but chances are that the revenues the state receives this year are, are going to be even worse than we imagined because COVID is worse, because the economy is worse. The reopening is worse than we imagined. So the state's not going to have a lot of money. And that, and that shortfall is going to be a real problem. First of all, you know, it violates the Constitution. I don't know what happens, I don't know if there's somebody in the wings who's gonna try to enforce that somehow, but there you go. We don't have enough money to meet the constitutional balance of budget provision. Um, and then of course the government has no money to do things, uh, initiatives, uh, incentives, uh, ways to rebuild the economy. Well, I don't see a good thing on the horizon here. How is this gonna play out? Well, like I said, we we're, we're just we're just hoping for the best. Um, uh, we we have you know a governor who's in power who uh, can do these emergency proclamations. Uh, we may get some relief in November uh, because the there there will be an election changing the makeup in all likelihood of the people we'll have to deal with, uh, and and hopefully. You know, between some or all of them, we can get to a better place than we are now. That's very optimistic of you, Tom, and I appreciate the optimism.
<laughs> well, thanks for having me on the show, Jay. <laughs> we'll see you shortly. We'll see you next time around. And hopefully things will be better. Maybe there'll be some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, maybe things will be clarified in some way. Thank you so much, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs>